Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Drive Better Decision-Making with Smart Data Solutions. I'm Dustin Heisler. I'm Chief Innovation Officer for Government Technology, and I'm excited to serve as a moderator for today's event. And just want to thank you all for joining with us. I know we're in for an informative session over the next 60 minutes. Our goal today is going to be to dive into a few different things. One, how San Joaquin County leveraged the data lake to apply analytics across the vast stores of data, enabling better service delivery and allowing the county to identify opportunities for improvement. Two, how a cloud infrastructure with autonomous capabilities can enable government agencies to reap the benefit of artificial intelligence and machine learning to generate immediate high quality insights and timely reports. And number three, how autonomous capabilities enhance system scalability and flexibility, allowing agencies to pivot when a crisis like COVID-19 generates sudden spikes or changes in needs or demand. Today, we're going to dive into what's happening in the data landscape, and then we're going to go through a series of fireside chats, exploring, number one, what's possible with data, but also what San Joaquin County is doing and how they've been able to unlock data for a variety of new use cases. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll have plenty of time at the end to tackle your questions as we get into our discussion today. Now, joining me to discuss this topic are Chris Cruz from San Joaquin County and Celesto Day from Oracle. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes introducing our panelists for you, and then we'll dive into the content. Chris Cruz is Director and Chief Information Officer for San Joaquin County. He formulates the strategic mission and vision for the information processing services, telecommunications, and radio dispatch for first responder support for the Sheriff's Department, fire municipalities, as well as the coordination of 31 county departments. He has broad policy authority for the standardization of the county's IT infrastructure and the county cybersecurity strategy, as well as the digital innovation services plan to drive transformation across the county. Prior to his work in San Joaquin County, Mr. Cruz was the, ch the Chief Deputy Director and Deputy State Chief Information Officer at the California Department of Technology, accepting that appointment in June 2015. He earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Management from California State University, Sacramento, and attended the UC Davis Executive Program for Leadership Excellence. Next up is Celeste O'Day, who's the Director for North American Public Sector Business Development at Oracle. She's responsible for a team focused on delivering solutions for the public sector in the United States and Canada. Celeste has more than 25 years' experience in driving technology solutions for the public sector industry from concept to market with leadership roles spanning across sales strategy, service delivery, and operations. She holds a degree in mathematics from Syracuse University and a master's in business administration from the University of Phoenix. So we've got a great group of individuals that we're going to have a, a wonderful discussion about the role of data. So let's first talk a little bit about data and the data landscape. We do regular surveys at the Center for Digital Government on the role that data plays in government IT priorities. And every year we look at you know, city, county, and state priorities. And as you can see on the screen, you know, from a city standpoint, cybersecurity is always number one. But what's interesting is when you start to go below this and you look at citizen experience and e-services, you see at number four, business intelligence and analytics. You see at number six, data governance, infrastructure modernization, cloud computing. Kind of going to the county level, you'll notice some similar trends here. You have business intelligence and analytics at number four, data governance at number six, infrastructure modernization at number seven, shared services at number 10. And then going to the state level, you know, you've got cloud computing and a huge push for cloud at number three, business intelligence and analytics and open government transparency and open data. And, and the net net of all of this is that data is really an underlying component of a lot of these IT priorities. But, you know, you're probably thinking, how have these changed? You know, what's really shifted? COVID-19 changed a lot of the not just strategic priorities for states and municipalities, but it also changed the IT priorities. But what we saw is that technology is now playing a more critical role in responding to uncertain situations than ever before. Look at any of our publications from governing to government technology, any of the major trade publications, and you'll notice that you know, this, this notion of government technology and responding to uncertainty is front and center. In fact, we put together kind of what this new normal looks like and how these priorities have shifted. And, you know, you'll notice some common threads here, work from home, you know, hybrid IT environments. How do you apply social distancing to the workplace? Uh, business process reengineering for remote work. We were often caught off guard in the public sector by having only partial business processes completely digitized. This whole push to modernize has also become front and center. There's a blurring of the lines with you know, health, and health surveillance systems and kind of protecting public health and data privacy. And then now, you know, the major topic of conversation is what do we do with proactive you know, recurrence response? How do we make sure we stay ahead of this? We're, we live in a fiscally constrained environment as well. So 
how do we navigate through this situation? And then, you know, our state legislators have been in session. For those states that are in session, they've passed a variety of new things that we have to stay in compliance with. And a lot of those things impact everything down to the, the data layer of an organization. So when you look at all these things, what do they have in common? I mean, when you kind of analyze those key components of it, really data is that common thread that supports both emerging technologies, you know, like AI and machine learning, some of the emerging behaviors that we're seeing around the need to stay compliant, the need to balance privacy, the need to be able to respond rapidly to anything that comes, and then the use cases that are emerging as well. I mean, you look at contact tracing and a variety of these other applications, and data is really the underlying pillar of all of that. And so we have to really think about how to make better decisions, how to have infrastructure in place that allows us to scale. So let's look a little bit at what some of these future data-driven government elements are. We see you know, everything from privacy-centric experiences to omni-channel government, to government as an API, to compliance as kind of key themes. And you know, privacy isn't going away. COVID-19 actually accelerated and really has put forth the need to ensure that whatever comes down the pipeline, that we have the ability to manage our data in a way where we can abstract personally identifiable information, but also manage it securely. When it comes to omni-channel government, you know, in essence, what's on the screen right now is a snapshot from our government experience survey data that just shows that agencies are now supporting more channels than ever. And so we have to be really cognizant of how to maximize those channels and drive value. How do we leverage data back from them? How do we not just push information out to pull information back and use that as a basis of making better decisions. You see the rise of third-party data integrations and APIs, and we kind of call this government as an API. How do we make our data accessible, but how do we make it appendable? How do we leverage third-party insights, whether it's GIS data or other sources, to make better decisions, to make that data have more use and to allow us to more effectively manage our agencies? And then lastly, you know, there's a huge uptick in consumer technology regulation, but also rec regulation down to the infrastructure level that will impact the way that we store information, the way that we leverage that information. California was first out of the gate with an Internet of Things bill uh, last year. And, and so we're starting to see more and more of this legislation, and this is something that state and localities have to be aware of. So data is this underlying infrastructure for the future. It, it helps us do more than, you know, just decision-making but it actually is what supports all of these new use cases. And there's a variety of different ways that you can look at how data can be put to practice. Uh, this is, you know, a maturity model that was created by Harvard, the Data Smart City Solutions, that talks about, you know, not just putting out information, but analyzing it and optimizing it. But there's a lot more that goes into data than just the citizen engagement side and the pushing of things out. And, and data can really be unlocked or can be restricted by its underlying structure. And so what we're going to talk about today is really looking at that structure from an infrastructure standpoint, from a governance standpoint, from a management standpoint, integration data model. There's a lot more that goes into data than just applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to it. You have to have the right foundation. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So at this point, I want to bring in Celeste. Celeste, thanks so much for, for joining us and sharing your insights today. Justin, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. So, you know, first question for you, I know, you know, you work with agencies across the country and, and these government agencies have been collecting data for decades. It's traditionally, you know, in these siloed warehouses, department by department. What's different today about how government should be storing and managing and leveraging this data? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, government organizations, regardless of their size, right, whether we're talking about federal government agencies, whether we're talking about states, uh, whether we're talking about municipalities or, or even, you know, a sub-level down, like a water district, for example, right? You know, data is everywhere and it's multiplying exponentially, right? And I think one of the biggest challenges that our government partners have had is really being able to harvest all the data um, and really glean the kinds of insights and information they need out of it. And it's, and it's somewhat constrained uh, in part by, to your point, some of the infrastructures that they have in place, kind of the segregation uh, of monolithic applications that they have, uh, the siloed kind of aspect of who owns the data, who manages the data, how that data is stored and access. Um, and you know, historically, it was very common for, for public sector customers to really have data that was slightly lagged, right? So not so real time, right? Maybe they have a warehouse that they refresh nightly, um, so that data is a little bit stale when you start looking at it. So the need to be kind of always on, if you will, and always current with the data 
is critical, right, as, the, as you look at the future. And it becomes challenging as we look at not only the explosion of the volume of data, but the kinds of data, right? So we've gone from a, what maybe historically was largely structured kind of data into very unstructured data now, right? We've got data uh, coming from sensors. We've got data coming from um, back office applications, finance and human resources. We have data coming from our customer experience um, applications or service centers. So GIS information that's out there, right? So all this data that doesn't necessarily seem to fit cleanly together because of the inconsistent nature of that data structure. So you really need a plan that helps you bring all those disparate kinds of data together uh, in into a converged um, structure that enables you to reap the value of being able to cross pollinate that information and get the insights that you really need. So, you know, and that can kind of take three directions, if you will, right? You can look at that in terms of connectors. So how do you connect all those disparate sources of data together? Um, maybe you do that through out of the box connectors, right? Or you look at consolidating that information together into a converged platform, a data lake, if you will. Um, and then you can bring in kind of the machine learning and the automation to help you maintain and mine that information. That's great, and I know you know historically agencies have needed specialized you know roles like data scientists to really reap the benefits from the data that they've collected. And today, many people, both citizens, government employees, they can get immediate insights from their data. So, so how has that changed? Yeah. So again, there's the volume of data and the kind of data that's available, and and, and the visibility to that data, right? So historically, again, data was often kind of kept inside the walls, if you will, you know, the, the view of the data and the access to that data was limited largely to kind of either siloed organizations internally, allowing for limited visibility um, to the constituents, right? Um, certain access you have to make available to them due to um, privacy or, or, or legislative requirements that mandate that this information be available. But now you have more information that you can make available, right? So the tooling is so much better uh, now than what we had in the past, right? And analytics tools that are embedded with artificial intelligence that really helps, you know, government customers identify trends that you otherwise wouldn't know to look for, right? We all have great ideas of what information we think we could collect and glean from our data, but the machine learning and the artificial intelligence that's now embedded in the analytics tools and in the data constructs out there really help you find new ways to use and, and mine your data and find things that you otherwise may not have thought to be looking for, right? Now, it does not eliminate, I would say wholeheartedly, the need for some data science-like people, but the tooling has really made it much more accessible to kind of first-line data analysts, right? That you don't have to have that kind of deep, insightful um, access to really immediately get value. And if we take it up a level, data visualization tools are ultimately drag and drop nowadays, right? So it really lets the line of business folks even get access to visualizing the information they have access to and really starting to gain insight immediately out of that. So I know that you know a common challenge and sometimes you know inhibitor to to really kind of unlocking data is around you know the security. And so agencies are really charged with protecting the most sensitive citizen data. So you know, what should agencies moving data to the cloud be concerned with, if anything? Is that a moot point today, or is that something that is still, you know, a viable concern? I don't think you can ever put too much, uh, um, apply too heavy of a lens on the need to secure your data and your information, right? Even with the open records laws out there, there's still certain pieces of information, whether it's PII or whether it's PHI information, that you still need to have you know, there's HIPAA guidelines out there that, that are mandating the control of this stuff. So the, the security concern certainly hasn't gone away. And I would say in, in some cases, maybe it's even accelerated um, by the concern that folks have with a third party provider, we'll say um, storing that information, right? That, that key, you know, data is currency, right? So storing that currency on your behalf is, is not a decision to be taken lightly. So, you know, but, Let's balance that with the fact that in all likelihood, the cloud providers that are out there in the market, we are 
more likely better equipped um, to be able to secure um, the infrastructure that underpins the data storage that we have out there. Um, we're always gonna be on top of patches and fixes and upgrades, um, which is oftentimes, not only is it a, a major lift for organizations to just maintain um, the currency that you need to with all the risks that are out there from the security aspect. Um, so it's hard, right? It's, it's, it's resource intensive for an organization to stay current. That maintenance mode, if you will, of your infrastructure and your architectures, you know, the old 80-20 rule, right? 80% 80 of your resource allocation is often spent to, if you will, keeping the lights on. Um, and so when you can redirect that responsibility, if you will, to a vendor provider who ultimately, they have high degree of need to keep that stuff as secure as possible. So they're always gonna be current. We're gonna be current with the patches and fixes um, and the latest um, security threats that are out there. So, but it's not enough again, just to secure um, and look at certifications. So, you know, there's, there's the FedRAMP certifications um, and the various DOD certifications that are out there that customers can look at and go, okay, well, you can check that box for me. So that gives me some level of comfort that you've kind of crossed the hurdles, if you will, to achieve those third-party government security certifications uh, and, and the overall approach makes sense. But really, we think you should also take a next level down and really think about what we refer to as defense in depth, right? So you really need security at every single layer of the architecture. So in order to keep threats not only from entering, but also from spreading, right? Because once they're in, um, their ability to create wormholes and spread and be pervasive um, can be challenging. So really, you need to take a look and optically look at things um, in that capacity. Also, you have to know, as COVID-19 is really highlighting for orgs, that the workforce is more mobile, right? Um, and historically, oftentimes, you, we limited access to our public sector workforce to be able to only access certain pieces of information or certain systems um, when they're either inside of our physical building four walls and connected to our VPN, right? Well, we've had to kind of rethink the way we do that. So as the workforce becomes more mobile and as the constituent base is more mobile, perimeter-based security is not sufficient, right? There really isn't a perimeter anymore. The perimeter is undefined. Um, so defense in depth based on identity management is really the path of the future. Um, that's really the only way to, to protect that sensitive information that you have. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's, you know, it's not just a badge or, or a certification, but it's really rethinking, you know, the entire architecture and how you embed security into the full, you know, spectrum of, of the environment. So uh, the next question I have for you is around analytics and, and just the different types of data that are out there, right? So when you think about government data, it's not just financials or text anymore, but now you've got video files, you've got images, you've got sensor data from edge devices, forms, all of this, you know, new kind of unstructured data how are you seeing government agencies handle these new forms of data? Yeah, so, you know, a, a good analogy that we kind of use to, to kind of bring it home um, is if you think about all those different types of disparate data and data types and data sources that are out there, it's really very much like your smartphone, right? You have a smartphone um, that you've got one place where you can go to get access to a bunch of different applications, a bunch of different information. You don't have to have multiple um, hardware or physical devices to be able to get all this kind of disparate access together, right? You've got your Maps app, which gives you your GIS stuff. Um, you have your banking app where you can see your financials information, et cetera. You've got your contacts, right, on your phone, et cetera. So similarly, you know, correlate that to the various types of data and data stores that live within a public sector architect, right? An architecture, an enterprise architecture. And it's really not practical anymore to have a large number of single purpose databases to handle that wide variety of data, right? And all the data management that goes along with that. So the focus on a converged database structure that gives you a single tooling and a single set of skills that enable you to manage all that disparate data, both in type and in form, and get it connected together is really critical. 
So I know that, you know, as we, as I kind of overviewed some of the data trends at the beginning, you know, AI and machine learning and all of these other emerging technologies are, you know, often kind of top of mind. Uh, we kind of call them the, the shiny objects. Can you break down what, what these actually mean and what they can do? Yes, I think there's a few kind of points that I would make here. You know, obviously the pace of change continues to rapidly accelerate, right? And that pace of change that's happening kind of across all of our consumption markets, right? We are, we are people, even if we work for the public sector, we are also consumers, right, of private sector capabilities. And so we, we bring that lens and we bring those private sector expectations to work with us if we work within the public sector or to how we expect to interact with our government um, and our you know, agencies that are providing us with services. So the need to really kind of align and, and understand the pace of change um, continues as it continues to increase, so do the corresponding expectations of other constituents and the customers of the agencies, right? Everybody wants mobile, they want it to be ubiquitous, they want it to be on demand, and they want it to be you know, a modern experience. Again, that, back to that smartphone analogy, right? That's kind of shaping our consumer expectations regardless of who we're dealing with um, out there at large. So when you think about artificial intelligence or chatbots or blockchains, right, um, they're really expected in a way to be part of a modern application, right? So people expect to be able to, you know, you've got Siri on your phone or, you know, or you say, hey, Google to your, you know, Google Home device or Alexa to your Alexa device, right? So that artificial intelligence and that ability to kind of interact with your technology um, is an expectation that consumers have out there, and that's no different in government as well. So the, the notional idea of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence is really all about the software getting smarter, right? So the more data that's, that the software has available to it to kind of mine and evaluate, interact with, the smarter it gets in terms of finding patterns, it's able to adapt quicker. Um, it can then you can create a model um, that enables you to consume data. You can then retrain that model as that data consumption goes up, which improves the forecasting that you get out of it, the anomaly identification that you get out of it, and some like tactical, practical things. I guess from experience or a, a, an example perspective would be you know fraud prevention. Right, it's a big concern out there at large. Machine learning can really help fill the void um, where we're brilliant humans, right? But machines, frankly, can be smarter than us and find patterns that we just can't otherwise find or at least find them much faster. Um, so identifying and preventing fraud is a big place. With the, the whole pandemic, right? Understanding the patterns of COVID transmission, um, for example, right? That's huge right now. And machine learning and analytics and artificial intelligence can do that much faster, quicker, and more effectively um, than we as humans can. So the last question I have for you is just around, you know, where to start. So for agencies that are kind of just beginning their transformation journey to make more effective data use in their organizations, any words of advice? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's the, there's the obvious sound bites, I guess I'll say, right? Think big, but start small, right? And, and really scale quickly. So you don't need to boil the ocean all at once to really get your journey underway. Um, I would say that really what you want to focus on are what are those high value opportunities where you can exploit um, the capabilities of analytics tools on all kinds of data, right? Whether it's structured, whether it's unstructured, and that it's real time, right? This would give you some quick impact, um, even if you have immature systems and technologies, right? Or maybe you don't have a full picture or comprehension of all the data that you have. It at least gets you on that journey um, and a key to that is also to gain agreement within the organization, right? And to the vision of how analytics and data can be leveraged, both to educate and inform, but to help you plan um, for what's coming or what could be coming in the future. Um, really take a look at, a lot of us have partners, um, technology partners, um, system integrator partners that we have had longstanding relationships with, you know, and those are fantastic, but make sure that you're reevaluating those periodically, make sure that the right ones, they give you the critical, the clear and the unequivocal guidance that you really need, um, especially in these times of crisis. And frankly, take advantage um, to the extent po 
possible, you know, capitalize on the opportunity that the pandemic has really um, brought to light, right? Which is the ability now to really rethink your processes, begin to transform the business model into something that has probably some longer term sustainability than in areas that maybe you weren't focused on in the past, right? So the process and discipline um, are going to shift and migrate and expand over time, and they're going to mature and, and recognize that going into it. Well said. Well, thanks so much, Celeste, for joining us. And before we bring in Chris, I also wanted to make the audience aware of a new initiative that we're uh, working on with Oracle called Meeting in Crisis, Stories of Public Sector Innovation in Turbulent Times. We're capturing stories, best practices, and learnings from the field and, and how agencies have been responding to crisis, this pandemic, and what we all can learn from it and be inspired by. You can learn more at govtech.com forward slash Oracle 360. And now I want to bring in Chris Cruz to, to dive into lessons from San Joaquin County, California, and how they're putting data to use and data in practice. So Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, great to be here, Dustin. So let's start today's conversation by just talking a little bit about how you're currently approaching data management in San Joaquin, California, and, and what were you doing prior? Yeah, no, I think that's great. That's a really important question. Thank you. I think we have more of an enterprise approach to data management and approaching data across the county. As mentioned, we have 31 different departments, uh, including public health, law enforcement, um, district attorney's office, public defender's office, human services, child support. So you can imagine there's there's great data demands, demands across the county and within our relative relationships to the state and cities as well. So we're taking a more enterprise approach of laying out data in terms of looking at data analytics, how we look at budgeting, uh, how we look at an enterprise approach of sharing data once and then disseminating it across the enterprise. So some of the approaches that we're, we're deploying, obviously, is looking at data analytics, looking at business intelligence in terms of how we look at data and how we manage that data. We are doing currently doing data mining. Uh, we have some data warehouses that we're pulling disparate data from and doing analysis on that data and, and again, sharing it not only with our cor partners, but also our corporate partners in the private sector as well from the health and human services perspective. So there's a lot of diversification going on right now in the county. And as we build new systems and transition from legacy mainframes or other uh, evergreening type applications, we're finding now that we're building interfaces in between our systems so they're very interactive in terms of how we exchange data and move forward with, I think, a plausible approach. Um, prior to that, really in San Joaquin County, we were doing things in more of a decentralized or federated uh, manner, if you will. Uh, a lot of data was collected through those respective 28 to 31 departments, and sometimes it was repetitive data. They were collecting that information, doing their own analysis and more of a siloed approach, and then coming up with information and producing it. So again, I think you know we're better off today in terms of what we've been able to accomplish and laying out, you know, corporate data governance, looking within our legal organization, really how we negotiate data sharing agreements and making sure that we are communicating with each one of our departments on how we're managing data. But really it starts with infrastructure. It starts with uh, having a common warehouse or an, uh, an ability to uh, integrate data across a single platform. That's great. So I know the, the theme of today's presentation is around driving better decision making with smart data solutions. So what role is data playing in your current decision making process in San Joaquin County? Well, uh, you know, one of our mantras in San Joaquin County is we're very much a data driven decision organization and I think that's really important. So as new data comes in, um, you know, based on various subject matter areas, we make different decisions. And, and I think that's really important in the transitory way that we manage in government and public sector these days. So really, I, I think some of the things that we're doing in, in that current decision process is looking at, for example, uh, you know, how employees are getting to and from work. We're, we're looking at where employee demographics are relative to San Joaquin County and how we look at transportation within those areas. We're looking at economic trends and how we look at revenue breakdowns within the county of where different revenue um, components come in from the county and how do we manage that and rely on that um, particular funding to uh, take advantage and effectuate a positive budget in San Joaquin County. Uh, we also look at payroll and what we're doing across payroll of the 7,400 plus employees of how we're doing analytics and, and doing assessments of that payroll to figure out 
hey, what's our total payroll look like and what is our ability both short-term and long-term to make uh, budget projections in terms of how um, payroll is made, how promotions are made, and just how much funding the county has to make those kinds of decisions. Also within our public health information inspector, how we're making decisions across uh, public health. Obviously, with the advent of COVID-19, you know, how we look at testing, how we're looking at information across our organization, how do we look at trends in terms of different demographics within the county of where there could be potential hot spots. So all of that's really coming in to, um, display in terms of how we're making data decisions. Uh, recently, we had a primary here in California in March just before COVID hit. So we're looking at our register of voters where we're mapping people across different demographics on where we should be putting precincts or new voter choice areas to make sure that we're optimizing the amount of folks that are capable of voting in San Joaquin County. Um, we're going to be using those projections of data coming up for the general election in November because in, in California the governor has adopted a vote by mail uh, process. So that's changing the way that we're going to be doing business in terms of vote by mail. So how do we attract and leverage voter uh, precincts and regional centers across the county? So those are just a few of the examples that we're using and letting data drive current decisions within uh, the county organization. So one thing I'd love to dig into a little bit more, you mentioned kind of using that transit data and, and you know, kind of the, that whole notion of kind of making better decisions with this. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing in specific to with the transportation side of things? Yeah, I think, again, we're really looking at, uh, you know, trend analysis in terms of where our employees come from. We're a very large county, probably the 10th or 11th largest county in California per capita population. And so we're looking at different areas for public transit or areas where, you know, there may be uh, busing available within that area or how, you know, employees could, uh, you know, partner and carpool in different specific areas. We're also looking at regional areas where maybe, you know, the situation is m uh, more efficient for telework in terms of laying this out because obviously in our county we have several people including myself that travel from other counties every day so we're looking at those trends of who lives close to san joaquin county what is the demographics by zip code and what are those that live outside the county and how can we continue to manage that another aspect of that too dustin is really about public works and our public works and, and transportation organization on how we should be maintaining roads and managing bridges based on the number you know the population that comes through on a daily basis. So you'd be surprised at how much we're really, really, really looking at our data and, and to make incredible decisions in the county to benefit our constituents. That's great. And I know in our prior conversations, I mean, you've got an entire data life cycle in place from data mining to warehousing to analysis. Can you kind of maybe break down how you were able to put this in place and, and kind of set up this infrastructure? Well, it all started actually prior to me coming there. My predecessor, Jerry Becker, who's now the deputy county administrator, assistant county administrator, uh, you know, started working with uh, looking at Oracle and working with one of our private sector vendors on how we can leverage data from an enterprise perspective. And so some of the things that they really looked at is, for example, hospital data. Um, underneath San Joaquin County, we have a trauma center in the Central Valley here in California. And it's one of the largest trauma and only trauma centers in Central California. So really, how do we look at decisions and how we set up data to both manage time, manage employee preparations and expectations, and really set up a, a process for the county to be successful? So those were some of the, the, the prevailing outcomes in, in really setting those types of uh, items up to really itemize the way we looked at data, both from a demographic perspective, the way we looked at constituents, how we set up homelessness data, how we identified camps to treat, you know, homelessness in San Joaquin County and in some of the other areas, and then shared that across our, our regional partners within our respective cities. So I'd love to break down maybe some of the short-term impacts that you have. You know, you, you had this great infrastructure, this great foundation, great partnership with Oracle. What are some of the, the more immediate impacts that you were able to see from that? Well, I think really around, um, obviously, we have a PeopleSoft system in uh, San Joaquin County. So taking data and deriving it from the PeopleSoft system and rolling that up, um, you know, into some of our decisionary making process helped expedite decisions around, um, you know, employee absenteeism in terms of COVID. How do we set up a structured process to manage absenteeism? How do we look at employee trends since COVID hit in terms of making decisions on um you know, impacts of efficiencies, how we looked at uh, really, you know, telework as a perspective. We, when this uh, pandemic hit, we suddenly put 5,000 people out on full-time telework. 
some took home their own personal computers. So how do we look at data to ensure productivity was happening and those folks could do their respective jobs and perform those applicable duties remotely? And so we were looking at those short-term impacts of the data practices and processes that were set up around budgeting with PeopleSoft and the Oracle budgeting component to help us drive and make some of those decisions on outcomes. And the outcomes, uh, you know, showed that we were being very efficient with people and, and most people actually worked more than an eight-hour day virtually. So those were some, some surprise data components and statistics to our board of supervisors and our county administrative officer, which is helping us be more productive today in terms of looking at what I call virtual work as a long-term solution for the county, not only to help with employee recruitment, but also retention of our current employees and staff. So then I know, you know, after you set up this, you know, great infrastructure, great foundation, and then a global pandemic came your way, how did COVID-19 impact or maybe change or accelerate the work that you were doing with data? Well, I just, I just think as the example that I just laid out, Dustin, I think it's really helped us, you know, Make, be more efficient and effective in how we did things. The other, I think, corporate area that we've been able to realize efficiencies is across our, our general hospital and, and looking at how many folks have been tested to look at contact tracing, to look at other you know, uh, alternative methods of how we evaluate our employees and plus how we you know, treat our constituents within the county, um, how our emergency medical services makes decisions to make sure that you know, we have enough hospital beds and ICUs open for our you know, most sicker patients. So really looking at that data across an organization, how we display that data on our website and looking at, you know, information on the number of tests versus the number of people that have tested positive. And, and again, as I talked about ICU representation, um, you know, how many people are in beds, how many people the average stay in the hospital. So it's been able to, I think, really reflect using this data to help make a whole bunch more efficient decisions on how we manage public health in San Joaquin County, how we manage public health within the county as a whole in terms of impacts to our employees, and how do we look at future trends moving forward and managing this pertinent situation. So outside of the virtual work capability, I think the public health decisionary making process with a lot of our regional um, partners in San Joaquin County is becoming more effective as a uh, as a result of this data and being able to data mine, being able to look at trend analysis, being able to look at analytics and artificial intelligence across this data from a, I think from a, what I call a common lens or a standardized uh, process and efficiency. So I know that, you know, when, when COVID-19 hit, you know, we, we saw expectations immediately rise for local levels of government, especially counties. They played a really crucial role in communicating information and trends. How did you see, you know, maybe your employee or citizen expectations change uh, when it comes to what data they wanted access to during the pandemic? Yeah, that was a, that's a great question. So one of the areas that we saw a, a lateral component of change was really around expectations of our employees and our constituents on information, having information frequent, having information quickly, and ensuring that we were posting uh, and publicizing information and data for them to help make decisions about sheltering in place or whether essential services were open. And a pretty good example of that is we developed a chatbot um, that really lays out artificial intelligence that's on our San Joaquin uh, dot org site. That really lays out now that those constituents can go and employees can go to that chatbot as a, as a way to get firsthand information, but access to all pertinent information related to COVID or any other essential service in San Joaquin County. And today we have that published on our site. We're taking that information from artificial intelligence and machine learning and developing more questions and capability around that. The most important thing is we're evaluating that data that comes into that chat lot to really look at trends of what our constituents think are very important and the kinds of services they want from San Joaquin County. In terms of our employee participation, our employees are also accessing that chat bot for, you know, real live information, for real time information, because that's changing almost on a daily basis. And we have to be more dynamic as a government organization now to make sure that information and making decisions is done quickly, it's done efficiently, it's done effectively, and it's presented to our employees and our constituents in an exponential manner. And so those kinds of data points and, and data outlets are helping us make better decisions, but also prioritizing from our constituents what's important. So, you know, is it law enforcement for the day? Is it, you know, um, district attorney? Is it, you know, public health and epidemiology? Um, how do we look at these specific things? So it's allowing a wide variety of enterprise diversification 
across our data endpoints. So a quick follow-up to that, actually, this one from the audience. Can you expand upon the tools that you implemented to establish, you know, this AI, this chatbot, the deeper analysis around it? Any any specifics on kind of what, what you're using for that? Well, we're using an open source platform. So that open source platform is, is built and managed and maintained by our county staff. And so we think with that diversification of an open source platform, we can continue to build that. So we brought in a, a third-party vendor to help us enable that and stand that up relatively quick because we knew that, you know, time was of the essence and uh, we needed to get something up quickly to look at, you know, how we expedite communication. So right now it is managed by my, my county staff and we're continuously building it out. So we've had this chat bot now for about four months. So it coincided with the pandemic. Fantastic. So, our so is to share that data and store that data in our you know, our data warehouses and mine that data and ensure that there's integration touch points with all our other uh, data components within the county. So that's something we'll be working on to attain here in the coming months. That's great. So, you know, from a use case standpoint, I love the chat bot. I love, you know, kind of the, the reaction and providing that real-time information for, for people when they need it most. Were there any other use cases that were applied during this pandemic that, that really, you know, data was kind of an underlying need of? I think, too, looking at probably across regionally, across all of our departments, because San Joaquin County is really regionally diverse in terms of where our county um, departments are and entities. But I think we were also able to look at trends across, you know, COVID and cases geographically and really helping us make decisions on where hotspots are, so to speak, within the county. Um, San Joaquin County has a very large agriculture industry within the county. So understanding where, again, folks are at, whether they're, you know, picking fruit or vegetables and other areas, how they could be impacted and be at a higher risk of COVID. So we're also collecting that information across our organization to make some determination on, you know, how do we treat and manage those respective areas and how do we effectively social distance. So I know a lot of that has been used by the public health officer to make key decisions as well. So I know a common question that I get is around, you know, there's lots of new types of technology and new uses of data that were applied, you know, in response to COVID-19. Do you see these sticking around through the fall and maybe kind of being a new way for, for people to access information even post-pandemic? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I agree. I think these tools are here to stay. I, I think this pandemic, unfortunately, I always say never let a good crisis go undone, has uh, really, I think, catapulted us to think differently about government and how we approach our job. So I know that for agencies that are just beginning their journey, you know, at effectively leveraging data, you've got lots of words of advice for where they should start. What are some of those best practices on, on where they should begin? So I think best practices really need to start with a couple of different areas. And I know this has been a long journey, even the data governance prior to me becoming the CIO in San Joaquin County. It really starts with good corporate data governance and having a diversification of folks within your respective organizations that participate in that data governance. I would also highly recommend that you bring in your legal folks within your respective organizations as well, because a lot of these are legal decisions to make in terms of exchanging and sharing data. I think having great data sharing agreements in place is very important, or MOUs, to make sure that, you know, you're sharing data, you have an understanding of how to share it, and it's done so in a secure manner. I would also bring in your chief information security officer within that data sharing component as well, so he or she can identify identity access management and other risk preventative measures that you should put in place and deploy across your organization. And those are some tools that we put in place within San Joaquin County. We have a three-year cyber strategy that we're deploying. We've deployed tools such as uh, uh, CrowdStrike and Tanium across our organization for endpoint protection and asset management and patch management from those organizations. So we're constantly managing our network to make sure that data going back and forth within our network is secure as possible. And then having those agreements in places with those third parties that we might exchange data with. I know that's a lot to do, but having that government structure in place is really important to data sharing and ensure that there's compliance uh, with outcomes and, and what you intend to do with the information. So those would be my recommendations in terms of starting what I call the data sharing evolution. Yeah, I think, you know, focusing on the foundational elements is such an important, you know, often misstep. So, so great, great advice for the group, and thanks so much for sharing. 
So as we transition to our q and I just wanted to remind you that you can plug into more information about what we've been discussing today, including interviews, content, our Leading in Crisis initiative with Oracle at the Oracle Government 360 hub at govtech.com forward slash Oracle 360. You'll definitely want to check out this resource. And now we're going to dive into questions. So thanks to our audience for asking and giving us so many great questions to start with. Chris, I know there was one question that we weren't able to completely hear your answer to that I'll give you a chance to, to kind of uh, talk about, and that's what you're doing with digital transformation as you prepare for August and the fall. Can you, uh, can you break that down for us one more time? Sure, no problem. And Dustin, can you hear me okay then? Yep, you, you sound great now. Okay, so really in terms of our, our innovation strategy is we brought a vendor in to work on our digital innovation and strategic plan strategy. And really what this uh, strategy and plan entails is looking at a three-year horizon of really developing a concrete roadmap for San Joaquin County. That includes our cities, that includes our municipalities, it includes our educational institutions. We have a, a government structure called San Joaquin County RISE, which is our Innovation and Services and Excellence Forum that's comprised of representatives of those entities, plus the, pro the private sector as well, our, our vendor partners that we routinely do business with in San Joaquin County, really to come together to form the foundation of what does the strategy really need to look like? So some of the items that we're dealing with and initiatives that we want to move forward with this outcome strategy is how we look at homelessness across the county and solve that as an enterprise problem rather than a silo problem. How we look at innovations such as 5G to implement that to ensure that we're leaving nobody behind and, and able to effectively bridge the digital divide. Um, how we look at, again, data sharing as an enterprise perspective. And then what are the priorities of each one of our 31 departments that um, look at technology as a way to enable good and solid business functions? So that's really important. That will encapsulate that three-year strategy. It would also have a roadmap of the priorities I identified and how do we get there from here. What are the roles and responsibilities? What are the technology and business people that need to be involved in effectuating those plans and projects and then carrying them out successfully? Um, I chose three years because I thought that that was a better evaluation given that, you know, every day there's something new coming about and, and time is going by so quickly and things are constantly evolving as a way that I could really level set expectations within the county, within our regional partners on how we do business. And I've always said that, you know, comprehensive planning leads to success and having a roadmap will get us where we want to go. So those are really the com combining factors for that plan, the combining strategy of that plan and how we lay it out to make sure that we're delivering quality services to our constituents and that we're doing so in a way that's using efficient and effective automation that we can all share across the county as opposed to being in silos as most government entities find themselves doing today. So our goal is to have that plan published by September 1st of this year. And from a best practice and lesson learned perspective, we would be happy to share that plan with anyone who's interested because I think paying it forward at this point in time is very important for all of our success. Great. So quick follow-up question, we'll stay with you for this. Uh, can you talk to what you're doing specifically around homelessness with data? Yeah, so homelessness right now is one of the areas that we were looking at as we were looking at utilizing our GIS capabilities for homelessness and looking at different heat camps across the county to identify how many homeless were actually in those camps. And so we were sharing that information across our GIS capabilities um, moving forward using ESRI. So that data is being shared, obviously, with our county departments in terms of making informed decisions and also with our partners in the cities of how we look at that situation. We we're hoping to take that a couple of steps further. We're continuing to evolve our homelessness activities by looking at when homeless folks go in, you know, to a drugstore, pick up prescription drugs, or where do they go to get foods from some of the different homeless shelters. So we're still evolving that analytical component to help us make informed decisions. Great. So Les, this one's for you. How did COVID-19 impact how your customers were leveraging data? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I think, you know, to be fair, since we're still in it, <laughs> we don't necessarily know the full breadth of, of what's what it's going to look like when we come out the other side. But a few really great examples out there. Um, a couple things that we're finding just at a high level um, that we're finding that customers are are recognizing that they need to create, they need to create budget, if you will, or, or create um, access to funds or redistribute funds 
And the best way to do that is through automation, right? So by automating processes, by automating some systems, by doing things like Chris mentioned with chatbots, um, it definitely helps to reduce some of their operational costs, their, their human costs for some of those um, less value added service activities and being able to kind of redirect those to an automated process is one thing we're definitely seeing for sure. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is we've got a few great use cases out there. So for I know there's a few um, higher educational institutions on the line listening in today. Um, so we have a great story at the University of Akron. Um, so they were using analytics originally to, to do some modeling on student success. And with the pandemic hitting, as most higher education institutions and even you know elementary uh, and secondary education institutions, they were forced to kind of go to a, a virtual learning experience, right? Um, so they were actually able to implement a new learning management system and collect data from that to have early warning identification of systems who weren't logging into their accounts, who weren't attending their virtual classes, um, things like that, and using that data to track their student success in conjunction with that. And they were able to, to use that information to identify essentially who was being underserved. And they were able to drive Chromebooks and hotspots out to students who just didn't have uh, the infrastructure, if you will, to support that distance learning that became necessary. So one great use case example um, for really being impactful for the, the consumer, if you will, or the, the students um, at a higher education institution. Similarly, as part of the Leading in Crisis session, you just a couple weeks ago, or last week, excuse me, talked to Vinny Taneha down at Tarrant County Public Health. Um, so Tarrant County, like all the other municipal counties out there across the states, have been trying to address, address this this crisis, right, and dealing with the testing that needs to be done and the screening that needs to be done and, and making sure that they're, you know, providing the services so that the, the constituents um, are being served, right, and being monitored and tested and tracked. Um, so that's a huge effort down there at Tarrant County that we've been working with them to get them those insights, right, to, to do the screening through an automated process so those constituents can self-screen, um, answer some questions through an online questionnaire, um, based on those answers to those questions, either provide them with CDC guidance. So if they were deemed not high risk, give them some guidance on, you know, how to take care and monitor themselves. If they were deemed at a higher level of risk, get an appointment scheduled so they could go get that test completed. Um, so they would know whether or not they had um, contracted um, the, the virus. Um, and then all the reporting around that, right? So from demographic information to ethnicity information, which is very critical. Um, in these times to really understand if it's impacting other popul certain populations more than others. Um, also, the impact on the homeless. Well, back to what Chris was just talking about, right? So those underserved populations, how do we make sure that those folks are getting identified and getting access to the resources? So some really super examples out there of real life use cases um, where they're using kind of these technologies and tools and the analytics and the data to help drive behaviors um, and inform um, and educate. And then I guess last but not least is, you know, the need to eliminate some of those air prone, air prone and, and human based tasks by taking advantage of the autonomous or the artificial intelligence machine learning capabilities in technologies today. It really lets the staff focus on those higher value thinking activities that are, that are critically important right now. Great. So Chris, last question for you. Uh, do all of your county departments use this model that you described, such as social services or behavioral health? And if not, is there a plan to make this a countywide business process? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. I think we're still evolving the process, so not everybody is using it. So I think over the next couple of years, obviously, we'll continue to uh, collaborate with our partners to look at, I think, common forms of data sharing across the county. So it's, it's an evolution right now that we hope to continue to enable moving forward. Fantastic. Well, I do want to be respectful of our one-hour commitment, so we'll have to wrap it up here. And in closing, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for today's event. And a big thank you goes to Chris and Celeste for sharing all your insights and expertise with our audience. And a special thanks to our partners at Oracle and Intel for enabling us to bring this worthwhile discussion to each and every one of you. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day.